Thank you very much uh, for attending our annual uh, forecast. Uh, this is for 2023. Uh, I would not even call it forecast. I should say outlook because basically when we talk about forecast, it's almost the predictions. And uh, this is a, uh, one of my favorite, uh, again, <laughs> slides. Prediction is difficult particularly when it involves the future. So I'm not a fortune teller, and this, this uh, session, this webinar that we are doing is mainly to uh, usually use the facts, use the statistics, and see what we are looking at. And what I'm going to look at is things, um, not only for this year, uh, putting everything together, because I think we've had some fundamental changes uh, in past two years. And I believe, and I've said it before, this year and the years to come, it's going to be, although it's going to be volatile, but there will be more predictable. We're going to get back to the basics, which is wonderful, which we had lost. And you will see after seeing all these slides, uh, what I mean by that. And you're going to be rewarded for doing your homework rather than a random you know, easy flooding money by the central banks and the Fed uh, really pushing a few stocks and making things look good on the surface. I think those days are gone. So basically that will be uh, our objective. So talking about predictions, uh, this is a survey of uh, the, 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 a lot of professionals uh, from the politics, the economics and, and everything else. And so this was what they had to come up with. This is the, the, the uh, officially what they came up with last year for 2022. Now there's, you can see again by the colors, uh, there's different subjects, uh, but the main one, the green are the economy. And uh, uh, the one of the prediction was last year that inflation slowly eased off and uh, you know, we're going to have uh, in the technology, we have another banner year for electric vehicles. Uh, we will have increased volatility of bullish European and Japanese equities. And uh, basically, as I mean, you can just follow up and see that uh, modest gains for equity. So these are professionals and this was their survey and this is what they came up with. So just wanted to share this, not that you put a lot of, should put a lot of value. This is for the 2023 predictions. And what you can see again, from the markets to technology, to economy, to geopolitics and everything else. So they think the global recession risk is high. There is a uh, interest rate will peak in 2023. Uh, talk about TikTok. I leave it up to you. One of the things about our, our uh, webinar today is I want you. It, it's want to go beyond just making you know my outlook. Um, hoping that these slides will be something that you can use as a reference, a reference point in the in the future. You can use the slides to go back and refer to rather than dig through different classes and different slides. So everything hopefully will be under one roof. So this is more going to be more a reference. So it's it will be interesting to come back to see what are some of these predictions. So let me start with this. This is the year that we had uh, for 2022. I've shared this before. And this is end of December uh, uh, 2022. You see the biggest winner was orange juice and then heating oil, rough rice, natural natural gas, soybean meal, volatility, VIX, corn, soybean, uh, soybean meal, uh, soybean oil, and live cattle. So you see quite few of uh, commodity related, uh, whether it's energy or food. And then the dollar had a banner year. And of course, we will discuss that. And then uh, we come back to the financial markets and the currencies. And you can see basically uh, that the stock market, for instance, S&P was down almost 19%. Russell was down almost 21. And of course, one of the worst ones was uh, NASDAQ 
being down 32%. Thirty year bond was down over 22. So for the you know, very rarely it happens that the bonds and the stocks they were down at the same time. If there's anything we can take out of this class, just I think this next two slides will summarize why you want to pay attention to all the different asset classes and why I think you should do some more homework and uh, basically why I'm hopeful to find value and uh, find opportunities in the coming years, not just this year. This is a 10 year, uh, uh, this is our friends from UK. So this is a British pound oriented, but of course you look at the all kinds of asset classes. So uh, this is looking from UK and the next slide we'll look at uh, overall from US point of view. But look at the 10 year annualized return. So of course, last year you see the broad commodities and we had been talking about this. Uh, they did very well. I mean, they did well in 2021 and 2022. Gold and UK equities, um, they were in the positive and then the rest, everything was negative. But this is what I want to pay attention. You see that for the 10 year annualized from coming from 2013 to 2022, um, what we have, we have the US equities the S&P 500 averaged 15.4%, global equities 11.2%, Japanese equities 8.4%, and so on. And you can see emerging markets actually average only 4.1% and gold was only 3.7%. Now, when we think about the gilts and that's a 10-year bonds um, in uh, notes in, in the UK, they were really almost zero. and uh, so the broad commodities were two and a half percent. So keep that in thought. And then let's look at uh, the past 15 years. For the past 15 years, again, uh, for 2022, finally, cash was up 1.6%, the only positive return. Other than that, you can see the high yield bonds, high grade bonds, international stocks. Uh, we had asset allocation uh, portfolio, large caps emerging markets, small caps and REITs, all down double digits. But for the 15 years, our large caps, this is a total return, was up 255, almost 255%, and the small caps were 182%. When we look at the, the uh, high-grade bonds, they are up 48% over 15 years. But look at what has happened to international stocks. They're only up 40 and a half and emerging markets. And what that means is if you would have bought them beginning of 2008 and held them till to end of 2022, you would have made 16% of your money. And cash is up 9.8% for all that time. I and mean, you can see cash, you know, your banks were paying 0.01% or 0.1%. So, the question is, do you believe in return to mean? And do you think we are really, the, the regime is changing as far as the assets goes? And we will discuss that. So, and again, I've, I've have it here, you know, an annualized basis, what has happened. But I just thought this is very important to see if for next 15 years, for next 10 years, will we have another 250% in large cap? Or is it time for emerging markets to catch up? So uh, that's just a food for thought. Um, another slide I want to share with doesn't include 2022. I wanted to look at from 1801 uh, for the last 220 years, which asset classes have done the best. And as you can see, um, we have the CPI gold bills, bonds, and stocks. And by far the stocks have been uh, the best investments in a long run. So uh, equities win in a landslide because of, again, we have to also take into consideration the dividend reinvestment with them. Since 1926, the stock market has generated a positive return in 71 out of 96 years. So basically it will be 71 out of 97 years. So 2022 was a losing year. 
Historically, the odds of making money in the U.S. stock market are 50-50 in one day, 68% in one year, 88% in 10-year periods, and 100% in 20-year periods. So for a long term, still the equities become the winner as far as compared to any other asset classes. So it's just a food for thought. If you are you have the luxury of the time and if you have let's say um uh, young uh, children or you know you want to invest that's the reason you know we look at the long term for the in, in investment so basically if you have that horizon there are a lot of values to be found so what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to look at the key factors, which are um, going to be our subject and uh, part of our forecast, again, for this year, and uh, some of them will be for the years to come. So we're going to discuss the Federal Reserve and the central banks. This COVID-19 variant is still with us in a different way. So it's not maybe COVID-19. We still have the China story with that. But there are things that are creeping up. So they are we are not done with that, despite the vaccination. Maybe it has gotten weaker in some ways, but then the new ones are coming. So we are that story is still with us. Mm -hmm. I will discuss interest rates with you. Earnings are also very important, and that's how the valuation comes into picture. Uh, we are looking at again the earnings season has just started. It's how the company is going to be able to uh, either pass their, um, uh, the, the, as far as the cost of their material to the consumer, can they do that? How is the higher interest rates affecting them? As you can see, you know, with the technology companies, they've already been uh, starting layoffs and uh, basically letting some of their workers go. They're on the cost cutting and uh, uh, situation. Some of the companies are really reporting um, difficult times ahead. So earnings are the key when we talk about valuation, why the markets get the volatility because of this complete change of, again, uh, I would say the attitude and uh, basically, especially we talk about central banks, how they decided to um, basically for the first time in all over 30 years going from uh, accommodating uh, policy to tightening policy so um inflation we will discuss it we want to see are we going to be in a recession this coming year we'll talk about the dollar china and emerging markets uh the geopolitics uh that's going to play a big role and and uh just it, it briefly even to geopolitics we don't believe that the russia and ukraine story is over it's going to be over soon people who know the russian history they know and I've discussed it before, the czars or the rulers and or the presidents in Russia, they know if they accept defeat, that's end of them and they will do anything. So unfortunately, and I hate to say this, this thing is going to drag on unless something really drastic happens. Um, we also have situations, for instance, in, in Latin America, uh, we have situation, we've got to watch China also look at the Middle East. We, we are looking at, for instance, the uh, the pro protests in, in Iran. It's not something that is dying down. It has gone perhaps underground right now, but it hasn't died. The same thing in Lebanon. And you know, when when you think about uh, uh, hot beds around the world, and uh, that's something that we want to pay attention. And also there's some elections coming up that we want to pay attention. Um, unemployment is also is an important factor. We want to, uh, as you know, the, the Fed decided to um, be on, you know, uh, on schedule and try to with the 3.5%, 3.5% unemployment. They feel they have an easier path to increasing the rates. But what is the real unemployment? And are we going to have, despite the fact that some of the banking and technology companies are laying off people, do we have um, the chance that we will get to that, let's say, 4.6% unemployment, which is acceptable to, um, to uh, Fed? Uh, 
but also I have to remember, you know, we talked about almost 2 million people out of job. On the other hand, you have to remember COVID changed things completely in a way that uh, a lot of uh, people who were uh, retiring, they, uh, uh, well, they were near retirement, a lot of baby boomers, because of COVID, they actually decided to retire. So they're not coming back. So we still have that problem of um, as available employees. Also, a lot of uh, low wages because of COVID, you know, obviously they didn't go back to work then. Now they have switched jobs. There's a lot of jobs that uh, people are choosing over their previous jobs. Um, there's a lot of hybrid jobs. So uh, this unemployment is not something that is going to happen overnight and still going to have pressure on inflation. So let's keep that in mind. Also, the federal balance sheet. I mean, we talk about inflation, but the federal balance sheet is $9 trillion. We've got to pay attention to that. We have, we have started, they have started, you know, again, uh, buying, uh, they've been buying back, now they're selling. They want to reduce their balance sheet. So, uh, but it's very slow pace. So that's going to have effect as far as uh, on the interest rates still and also the social security i put down here because uh, i just want to discuss it right now you know uh, because of the uh, cost of living what we have the cost of living we have the social um, uh, security as you know they go up every year and this year is nine percent that's nine percent and we talking about maybe 30 percent uh, out there that they're going to get nine percent extra and that money comes from the government so that's going to put pressure and that's also something we have to think about from the economic point of view and uh, that's uh, something that has to be dealt with and also we have with the, the balance and you know the, uh, as far as the budget and uh, the debt ceilings you know we kick that down the road but politically that will be something we have to pay attention again in, in july and uh, these are all these pressures and the the days of as i mentioned the easy money is gone so i mean from the fiscal point of view can they print more money and it, the things have changed so these are the pressures are under so let's start with the first thing is all the eyes have been on central banks and central banks, not only in the United States, but around the globe. So uh, first of all, the major central banks that we want to pay attention is obviously everybody watches the US, the Fed, but also we want to pay attention to the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Swiss National Bank, Bank of Canada, Reserve Bank of Australia and Reserve Bank of New Zealand. These are the top ones. Uh, of course, the National Bank of China, when we think about China, it's also important, but they're in a different environment. Obviously, they've been, uh, and because of the closing of the, uh, the economy, and also we will discuss it a little more, they've been accommodating, they are, you know, the real property and the real assets. Uh, real estate there they have been uh, at the margins they had their own uh, been working on their own world in that sense so but if you are investing in uh, you're looking at uh, basically as far as the currencies but also the economy and the equities and the bond markets you want to pay attention to these central banks so when I say central bank what I mean by that just briefly is you know every nation has a, a central body and what they do they are responsible for the economic and monetary policies and that's why it's called central bank so it's not like commercial investment banks that uh, they are not market-based and they're not competitive so their biggest job is in it's the inflation, employment, and they use interest rates to control that. So uh, just a, um, as far as a trivia, what is the oldest central bank in the world? Uh, well, Bank of England is the famous one, was established in 1694, but the Sweden Central Bank, the Riksbank, is the oldest central bank, and it was founded in 1668. So... 
these central banks, like, as you can see, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of control. But as Yogi Bear said, in the theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So I did this slide of about a year ago, 10 months ago. And what I was looking at at that time, I know it was about February, I think it was uh, Loretta Mester was uh, from the Cleveland uh, Bank, Cleveland Fed. And uh, she was coming on as a uh, uh, again, voting member of the FOMC. But when you look at her background, she has never worked outside the Federal Reserve System. And then I did digging into all the members at that time. And every one of them, every one of these members, they have been either academia or the government. They've always had a paycheck. They, um, except Kashkari from Minnesota, who, who did work at uh, hedge funds and uh, you know, for, for private uh, portfolios, uh, nobody else has worked. And since then, this was done again almost a year ago, so we had uh, a couple of changes. Uh, there was uh, uh, Kenneth Montgomery was the interim head of the Boston Fed. That was just an interim. And then we had Meredith Black, uh, head of the Dallas Fed. Those two also, they were academia. And, and then, so what happened for the Boston, we got Susan M. Collins. She became the uh, Fed Bank of Boston, the CEO of that. And I just want to just just a food for thought to see the, her work experience. As you can see, University of Michigan. Um, she's been the professor of public policy. A lot of university works and the government works, and uh, she's a PhD. But uh, everything is related to theory. And this is Lori K. Logan. She's the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and. Uh, and she's also in, again, you can see her got a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University. The reason I share this with you is a lot of uh, now, after the facts, they think that, you know, Fed has been behind the eight ball and they did not uh, really act uh, prudently. They were way behind. They thought inflation was transitory in the short term. They, and now they have to, it's like really catching up. So it really, these are the people who, again, they can come up with the formulas and other things, but as far as real life, you know, a, being a self-employed and entrepreneur is completely different than reading the books and following the books. So uh, that's important. So that's why this, sometimes it's it's good to, get your hands dirty and understand what is happening with the real life. And in this situation, perhaps that's why we are paying a little price. And last year was a good example that how the markets could react. Now, one of the things also I want to remember since we're talking about central banks with the 12 members, what we have is there could be uh, a few changes. Few of these uh, Fed members could leave and mostly they're the hawkish ones. But even uh, when we uh, share with you as far as uh, uh, Mary Daly, which is one of the was one of the dovish ones, now she's turned hawkish. So it's not just guaranteed because the hawkish ones are leaving. You know, automatically all the rates are gonna stop and actually go down. So pay attention to that. Talking about central banks, I want to have this. This is all the dates for the 2023, so you will be prepared. And um, as you know, we have uh, special trades for the FOMC days. So these are um, the eight dates from the uh, Jan well, February 1st will be when they come out. And it, so you can use this to make sure that you have, uh, uh, you're prepared for um, these days. Now, the other thing is I want to remember there's something called the Fed blackout. And what is that Fed blackout is it is a time that uh, the, 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 these Fed officials, they are barred from making public comments, no interviews, no press releases, no buying or selling of any assets, nothing that could indicate the market 
how they are feeling. So it's important this these times are called the blackouts. So because again, they're not supposed to be an arm of the stock market, so they're not supposed to really influence it. Although, you know, the times have proven us wrong. Uh, they have been able to sometimes even inadvertently, you know, by slowing down the markets or by pushing the market. So with the wealth effect and with the slowdown and the recessionary, again, they have played these games, especially uh, post-COVID. But these are the dates. I just want to share those with you. So from January, for instance, 21st till the day after, February 2nd, you will not hear any um, any calls or speeches. So of course, next week you will. And so you want to be ready for that because they do influence their speeches, do influence the, the, the markets. Um, so that's as far as actually understanding the central bank. So now we want to dig deeper and find out where are we with the inflation? Where are the interest rates going? Um, are, are we going to have recession? And is it going to be a deep recession or is it going to be a hard landing or is it going to be a mild one? So again, uh, I'm just I'm not forecasting. I'm just looking at the data and what uh, my thoughts are as far as Again, what could happen? So let's start with the um, the CPI. That again, this is not really the true picture of things, but that is what we have is the basket. And as you can see, you know, uh, we just had the, the latest CPI for December, and by looking at this, you see this is the first time we actually had a negative one. We had a flat one, and then we had this negative one negative 0.1% that um, um, uh, basically what happened was uh, it came better than, uh, or it was as expected. And we go back to the COVID era since we had the really negative ones. And you see, we almost peaked up, uh, but this is not with at six and a half percent year over year, we are not um, out of woods. And as we talked about unemployment, that doesn't mean the Fed is going to just say, oh, this is great. We are in the right direction. So we still haven't seen complete effects of their interest rates. So actually what you see here, and that's the one thing you have to pay attention. So far, I don't see that inflation has gone down, which is not that much, really. When you have a target of 2% and we are at 65 we still haven't succeeded. This was more of a reflection from the, uh, for instance, the energy prices, the, the crude oil prices, some of the food, the used cars. And uh, basically that was a reflection, not because of what was happening. Now, uh, the next slide, I just want to show you for December, we can see, you know, year over year, this gives you an indication how much uh, of inflation there is when we're talking about food and uh, energy, fuel, oil, and water, and air for lettuce. So you see that the food itself was up 10.4%, energy 7.3%. And then uh, the only ones that it went down, this is as of January, again, 12, and the numbers came. The major appliances and gasoline was a big help. And then uh, we finally, my God, it's been very expensive to eat those steaks. Uh, the car rentals, the uh, used cars, and the uh, television. So that have come down. Now, one of the things, a big component is the rental. So what has happened with the rental a you know, people are still in the middle of the contract, so they're paying the higher price. The only time you can see the reflection is un unless there is a, a new rent contract, which has come down a little bit. But by the time we get all these new contracts, it will take quite some time. And as you know, the housing, especially the, 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 the rental aspect of it, is the largest part of the index. So again, this is a gradual downturn. As far as the inflation goes, although it looks like we have peaked, but there's still that the wage we talk about employment. So 
inflation still going to be with us in some ways on the other hand you know people who buy used cars they don't just continuously buy used cars so it's uh there's some stuff that they're like a one time we talked about the health care so there is the two sides of things we have to pay attention but as far as the inflation it doesn't look like that they're completely out of the woods and uh although the direction is right uh doesn't look like you know the fed is just going to stop and then you know there's a thought that after for six months we're going to go down so uh, they're going to uh, reduce the rates we still got again i mentioned to you as far as the um as far as the, the the balance sheet you know the quantitative tightening that hasn't really taken that much of effect yet so talking about that so the the, the markets like the numbers with the inflation so what has happened I, this is I put down the the address the cmegroup.com and look at the interest rates. It's really interesting how much information there is through the um, a lot of resources for free uh, government resources and um, exchanges. And what you can see here is right now for the February first meeting is ninety three point seven percent given that we will be at 450 to 475, which means a 25 basis point, and only 6.3% 50 basis point. So what happened was, this is when the, the new inflation numbers came. This was a week ago, there was a 25% um, or higher or lower chances. There was only 75% that we will have 25 basis point. A month ago was 61%. So that's what the markets like. The direction of in the rate of increase is getting lower and lower. So you can see that if we 75 basis point that the way the, uh, you know, the Fed started, it's at 0% right now. So the markets are really taking into account that there is going to be only 25 basis point. A lot of the central banks, uh, Fed uh, presidents going around, they've kind of are happy with that. But then you're going to be prepared if they come up with 50 basis point, you know, that's going to shake the markets completely. Now, when we go and, and take a look at, the, the, for instance, the May, we see that for the May, that's when the idea is we will have another quarter and then this will be at 4.75 having the five percent we are at 54.6 and five and a quarter there's a thought of 33.4 so uh basically the markets are thinking that the chances of being at 54.6 percent i mean uh, going up to 4.75 to 5 is uh pretty high and um but there's still that thought. Even some people think we could go to five and a half percent. So all of these put pressure, obviously, on on the housing, on the markets. <clears throat> and then I want to go even further. Now, this is what's interesting at this time, and why you see the discrepancy between the short-term uh, rates and then the long-term rates is for December meeting. Uh, what the markets are putting they think that we actually gonna be going down we're gonna be at either at four and a quarter to 450 there's a 30 percent chance or four and a half 4.75 so the thought is after the first half because of the thought of slowdown in economy actually the fed is going to come back and maybe cut the rates and that's what the long-term bonds are telling us. That doesn't mean that the Fed is going to do that, but the markets are pricing that in. So it's very important to pay attention to that. So you can see how the volatility happens and why the valuation has become difficult in some ways for the like uh, putting on S&P. And that's why you see these movements. Um, we will talk about the stock market shortly and you see... Uh, what I mean by that now this is where we are right now so we are at four and a quarter to 450 so uh, the, the chances of again 
to stay in this situation has gone up and then um, from 29.4 a week ago and 27.6 a month ago to that 30 uh, uh, going to 4.5 it's actually 20 30.4 we almost flat right now so there is it's been the thought that the markets are going to take into account that there might be a rate reduction after going up we've shared this with you you know the long term trend of actually the markets that 4.3 4.2% area has been the resistance so that's what we've been uh, again the 10 year note is telling us on the yield and when i look at actually the chart of the monthly chart you see how we have a big support uh, under us this is a monthly um, chart of the 200 month moving average so having said that it's this is very important it's not just united states it's around the globe this is the government's interest bill and because of the higher rates, you see it's forecasted that because of these rates, the, we will have every, um, and the interest rates, if they're at 4%, we will add $1 trillion. So one of the things that I have thought about that it will put a cap on interest rates is, you know, it's kind of a self-serving in a sense that a lot of obviously governments how can they service this so uh, there is a chance that we will have a cap on all the interest rates uh, in the major central banks because they cannot afford how can they um, start paying this much of so the interest and uh, basically politicians don't care because they all live for the short term so they will borrow as much as they can but eventually that's how the the empires have demised so basically we want to make sure it doesn't go out of hand um this is something it was an exception this past year i want to share this chart with you what happens when the s p goes down what happens to the stock market uh, i mean what happens to the bonds as you can see it was one time in 1931 the stock market went down 43.3% and the bonds went down 2.3%. Other than that, every time that the stock markets have gone down, the bonds have gone up. And that's the reason we have this, uh, you know, portfolio allocation, you know, that's 60-40 because generally that's what happens. But in 1973, we had, we were down 0.7, but this past year was, uh, you know, was the probably the biggest year that you know the bonds were down, I believe over 16, 17 percent. So did obviously the stock market. So that was an anomaly or nothing had happened, but generally this is what we expect. And as a matter of fact, now the bonds and uh, the, the treasuries and bills are finally offering an attractive uh, yield. By the way, th 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 this is as of December 31st, 2018. Just want to share that with you. So what are our thoughts about recession? And we've talked about the inverted yield curve. So this is uh, coming from New York Federal Reserve Bank. So what they look at it, they look at the spread. We, we talk about 10 year and two year. They're looking at the 10 year and three months. And we are somewhere around here so in this zone, so according to this chart, there is about 50%, 45 to 50% chance there will be a recession. Majority of the firms, uh, investment firms and, uh, and financial uh, banks, they believe that we will have some kind of a, um, a recession, second half, the first half it will be uh, volatile the markets are still absorbing uh, what the fed has done and eventually fed is gonna stop increasing this is the question that the thoughts are that after the fed pauses by end of uh, the year and beginning of 2024 they're actually gonna uh, lower the rates but 
it's very difficult to see how we can get to 2% target on inflation, what they have decided as a target. So that's uh, this is um, another chart of the 10-year minus three-month bill rate. This is where we are right now. As you can see, uh, we are in the negative zone. And that's generally, there's a, about 12 months um, uh, as far as a, a time lap, lapse. So basically what tells us there's a chance of recession is pretty good. Um, this is the latest one. You can see on the two-year, 10-year, the, 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 the curvature and how inverted it is. Uh, we are at points or 72 bases, the, the spread. So that's what the, the markets are looking at, the odds of it. And they believe that that's what the, the long-term bonds are so attractive. Now, finally, as I mentioned, we have a market that you can actually have attractiveness. Imagine you can invest your money in a three-month T-bill and have an attractive return. So the money is coming back to those uh, you know, short-term instruments, but also fixed income. Finally, allocation uh, will go back to the basics, the fundamentals, in a sense that you can make money. You can make yield on your money rather than sitting doing nothing. And the only avenue, if you recall, we had was in risky assets, such as, uh, you know, large cap, these FANG stocks, for instance. Um, the other reason that there could be a recession, we have something called leading economic indicator. We have, um, we do have, uh, we've had a class on, you know, how to profit with the economic indicators. This is one of them. And it is basically what it tells us, and you can see where we are. This is from David Rosenberg. Now, he says that seats for the 2023 recession were sown a while ago by the relentless decline in the conference board's leading economic indicator, which has now fallen for nine consecutive months. So this is where we are. So basically the data go back to 1959. And he says that I can tell you that at no time in the past, have we seen a string of weakness like this with 5.6% annualized contraction over such a time frame that failed to passage the recession, uh, uh, presage the recession within a quarter or two? So um, they talk about, you know, call it a nine for nine back to 59. <laughs> the recession is starting us in the, uh, staring us in the face. So basically what it, it, it means these are the indicators so the real money supply as you know we have the contraction now it's 35 percent weight average weekly manufacturing hours interest rate spread which we emphasize a lot the new orders of consumer goods suppliers delivers stock prices consumer expectations building permits average weekly initial unemployment claims and new orders for durable goods. So these are all the leading indicators. The question is that uh, the Fed is most likely, they're emphasizing on the coincidental and the, 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 rather than the leading, which is the most important one. Also the single house family, I thought just obviously it's a, a big uh, sector of our economy. You can see aftermath of financial crisis, what we want to uh, uh, look at is the, the debt in the housing markets versus the equity. Look at this gap. I mean, this is what we had in the housing bubble. So something has to give. Obviously, there are a lot of people who have a, a lower interest rates are stuck with it and they love it, actually. Um, but there's a, there's a big gap and that's what the idea is there is going to be a correction in the housing slowdown. It has already started. All right. So having said that, so where we stand now, again, the employment uh, could slow down, but still the wages are there. There's still, there's a pressure on uh, employers. There is, uh, and as I mentioned, especially the, the lower wage earners, they've had the highest movement as far as the job opportunities 
and then we have the again uh, people who are retiring they're not coming back so there's still that pressure there so that's not helping with the inflation but also there is uh, the pressure on the earnings so that's what we have to talk about and that's what we will talk in the stock market so before i go any further let's talk about again i've used these slides before as far as the predictions i'm not in the business predictions and it's almost like gambling so i've used these quotes over and over again benjamin graham i'm skeptical about stock market forecasting by anybody and particularly by bankers John Templeton, there will be bear markets about twice every 10 years and the recessions about twice every 10 or 12 years, but nobody has been able to predict them reliably. So the best thing to do is, and that's what I want to emphasize, and that's what I think, you know, being um, an analyst these days is important doing your own research. So the best thing to do is to buy when shares are thoroughly depressed, and that means when other people are selling. And Peter Lynch says there are economic facts and there's economic predictions and economic predictions are a total waste. And then Warren Buffett, I make no attempt to forecast the general market. My efforts are devoted to finding undervalued securities. And there are many of them. Now, you also have to remember today being January 14th, 2023, we've had a big move in some of like undervalued uh, stocks. So the markets had moved up somewhat, but they were some big moves, and especially in S&P. Now, there's, um, there are some real buying, but there's a lot of short squeeze going on. So these rebounds, you just have to be a little uh, be, uh, wary of that. So we just want to make sure there's a thoroughly believe in these companies. Um, so talking about predictions, this is one of my favorite um, I want to share with you what the prediction was in some major Wall Street analysts. This is end of 2021, and this was prediction for 2022. Remember, S&P was at 47.66 at that time. So some of the major ones they target was 5,200, 5,100, even as low as 4,400. And of course, S&P finished at 38.39. The average for 45 Wall Street analysts, which they get paid really nicely and they get nice bonuses, was 49.10. That's uh, almost 1,100 points higher than where we finished, which is about 30%. So, but also we can see there's a 20% gap between the highest and lowest prediction. Now, for 2021, the prediction was in 2020, S&P actually outperformed analyst median prediction by 20%. So, so much for that to put in your faith in um, some of these experts' uh, predictions. So that's what I keep saying. Again, these are the times that you have to do your own really homework. So uh, what is happening this year? This is for 2023 target. And I put this again, any believable prediction of the future will be wrong. Any correct prediction of the future will be unbelievable. So the average price target for the S&P, uh, we are very close. I mean, we're right around, not too far from that is 4080. This is based on forecast by 23 analysts. So you can see there's a wide gap from 4750 to 3400. So you see there's quite a bit of negativity too. I mean, or not much growth. Basically, there's a lot of talk, maybe around 4,300 on the positive side. Um, but uh, there are, you can see there's lessons learned. So this is, again, you can, I don't, you don't want to frame it, but just put it aside and take a look at it later in six months. And next year, we can take a look at that. So, so I want to approach our valuation in different ways. I want to look at the sentiment and seasonality um some of the timing of the things where we stand and then we look at the fundamentals so first of all there's something called calendar effect and this calendar effect is an, an anomaly um there's a lot of anomalies we've had um the, there is a super bowl for instance you know uh, old american conference versus a national conference when the national team wins 
the markets go up and it's been up 88%, but really it's coincidental. There is no really rhyme or reason for that. There was another one is uh, the, as far as uh, the, the, the length of the skirts that the females wear, for instance. The shorter the skirt, the more positive as far as the economy, the markets will go up. So, and the whole idea was it starts in 1960. And then like in 1970s, we had like the midi and maxi, these long dresses, it was the beginning of 1970s. So they said, look, you see what happened? That means when you want to show your skin, you know, you're feeling good about yourself, you're looking good. So, well, that's what the, uh, the mood is good. So the markets will go up. So there is no really complete reasons but these calendar effects they have some uh valid reasons they have the history and some of them i want to share with you and i've shared this with you many times it's sell in may principle so it is sell in may so that means you, what you do you hold your stock till april 30th you sell it on may 1st all this is don't sell but you, you sell it and then you go away and come back at uh, end of october and then the clock starts November 1st till May 1st, and that's the best. And we have historical reasons for that. So I didn't want to just bombard you. We've had classes on it in the past. There's something else is called January effect and January barometer. And that's also, it's as January goes, so it goes the year. And it's a very uh, high percentage of that. So if January is down, uh, which actually this year uh, 2022 didn't work but most of the time if january is up the market will finish strong if it's down market finished weak so and uh, uh, mark twain effect is when everything is down by october and the october lows are hit then november december january are fantastic months usually when the lows are the october's uh, effect monday effect usually is uh uh, if there is a Friday and Monday sells two in a row, that's very negative. But generally, if it's not, let's say Friday was up, Monday's down, that's a uh, buying point. And the weekend effect, turn off the month effect. We've already talked about that at the end of the month and first of the month, they're strong. I want to share this. Uh, oh, this is another one from Ned Davis. Um, using data going back to 1896, he looked at how the S&P 500 has performed in years ending the numbers zero through nine. The best performing years ended in five, like 1915, 1925, 1935. With those years having a median gain of 26.3%. The worst years, however, end in zero, 1920, 1930, 1940, with a median loss of 6.6%. It was the only year with a negative median Though years ended in seven, average a negative of 1.1 decline. So this is just going back to whatever it's the cycles, could be presidential cycles, or but that was one. This one is very interesting because we just went through it. The first week of January, we were up uh, a little under 2%, depending on what you're looking at, Dow or SP. So there's something called January's first five days, an early warning system. In the last 47, up first five days were followed by a full year gain of 39 times. That is 83% accuracy ratio and 14% average gain in all 47 years. The eight exceptions included flat years in 1994, 2011, 2015 and four were related to war and 2018. So Vietnam military spending delayed start of 1966 bear market, ceasefire imminence early 1973 raised stocks temporary, Saddam Hussein turned 1990 into a bear, and the war on terrorism and instability in the Middle East and corporate uh, malfeasance shaped 2002 into one of the worst years on record. In 2018, a partially inverted yield curve and the trade tension triggered a fourth quarter sell-off. So the, the 25 down first five days were followed by 14 up years and 11 down years, which is, so you can see when the 
are down, there's it's only 44% accurate and it's up on 1%. So in pre-election years that we are now, the indicator has a respectable record. In the last 18 pre-election pre -election years, 13 full years follow the direction of the first five days. So this one, we were up. So coming from this point of view, now it looks like you know the markets could be up because we were up the first five days of, um, of the um, stock market, or we were very close. I mean, we can talk about five trading days. The second thing I want to look at is the, the election year cycle. And I reviewed this last year, and that was one of the reasons I had mentioned to you we were negative about 2022. We suggested with the midterm elections and also being the second year, usually it's negative. Forget about the inflation and interest rates and what the Fed is going to do. It just, that's if the... Uh, the sitting president wants to do anything, that's where they push their agenda. They don't care about elections at that time. And that's the reason a lot of time midterm elections turn against the sitting president uh, who's ever is in the office because they know they got two years to make up for whatever they've done. So, but on the other hand, the pre-election is very strong. So that's another, if you want to check mark positive things about this year. Um, Although, as I mentioned, the thoughts are that the first half, we will have a very volatile up and down, and eventually second half, by, end, by December, we will be up for the year. But this is one of the positive reasons. So what is that? As far as the statistic, this includes into, into 2023. Investors should feel somehow secure going to 23 because there has only been one down year in the third year of a president's presidential term since war-torn 1939, which was the off was 2.9%. The one loss occurred in 2015. Dow was off 2.2%. The only severe loss in a pre-presidential election year going back 100 years occurred in 1931 during the Depression. So again, these are statistics. I just want to share that with you. Uh, again, we are looking at the probabilities. We have to look at all the other things. That's what we're going to do next. But I just want to tell you as far as the pre-presidential. And so I'm going back to Roosevelt. And you can see I have every single president. Um, you see every one of them has been up, uh, including when Reagan, which had the 1987, uh, what happened. And then... Um, we have Trump. This is only Obama. We talked about 2015 was the only year they were slightly down. But other than that, every single pre-election uh, year was up. So here is more the four-year presidential cycle uh, week. So what happens in uh, looking at uh, the midterm elections and then the, the pre-election, you see uh, markets act positively. Um, when we look at the Dow Jones, for instance, for the one year pattern from for the past 120 years, this is all the years. And this is the pre-election years. You can see um, seven versus 11%. And then uh, when we look at from 1950, after the World War II had ended, um, the same thing, much more positive. As far as the returns go, 16 versus eight and a half. And uh, so that's another statistics. Just start to just give you another food for thought. And the other hand is we have the, uh, we had a down year, obviously, but since 1942, the market has had 21 down years out of 80. Thus, it has been up 74% of the time. Again, this is uh, as of 2021. So um, actually, no, this is uh, this is most recent. Actually, now we just started 2023. So um, yes, yeah, so as of this is just a little up that we had 2023. This is 2022. So on the of the 80 years, only two times did we see declines of two plus years in a row. 
and that's 2.6% of the years. So we had the 2000, 2001, 2002, we had three years in a row, and then 73, 74. If you go back in the 1930s, we had the three years in a row, but generally the thought is it's, it's an anomaly. Very rarely we have two years down in a row. So just another statistics. So statistically, the markets look positive. The other thing is as of 2021, the market has dropped 20% or more 11 times in the last 66 years. And uh, the last one from high to low was 2020, but we also had it again in 2022. So, um, but it's, it is again, the 11 times in 66 years. So just a food for thought that that magnitude doesn't happen often. Um, just want to share with you since 1997, seasonality, again, March and April are positive. We have August and September, and then November, October are positive. Um, so another analysis we want to look at, now let's talk about the fundamental side of things. So we've talked about the Buffett indicator, which is a ratio of the United States stock market to GDP. So this is as of January 6th, the ratio we've, we've had aggregate US market was at $41.6 trillion. Annualized GDP is at $26 uh, trillion. So what the, it is, we are at 160%. We had hit the two standard deviation, really, that, uh, that was giving us the warning. We, we had talk, talked about that. And uh, so that's from the fundamental point of view. Now we are just under the one standard deviation. So we still overheated 24% higher than longer term trend lines. And remember, we don't have quantitative easing to help us. So this is from the fundamental side we are on the expensive side. So we want to take into the consideration. And that's what I said, we got to be selective. There are opportunities out there. Now let's look at from the valuation point of view. This is from just recently from uh, Yardini Research. And what he's looking at, by the way, he's usually half full, um, uh, very bright, brilliant, does great research is what he's usually look at things a half full. But according to him, uh, we are looking at the earnings per share for the S&P that his thoughts are we will be about $230 forward earnings on S&P. So talking about that, then we want to look at, uh, we looked at the Schiller PE ratio as far as evaluation goes. So basically it's Schiller PE, the difference with the regular PE is, is based on average of inflation adjusted earnings from the previous 10 years, which is known as cyclically adjusted PE ratio or CAPE ratio or PE 10. So where we are now, we are at 29.24. You can see where we were in 2000 and where we were in 2020, 21, we were here. So basically compared to the mean, mean is 17. And this is just uh, uh, as of uh, Friday the 13th, the median is 1591. So even if you look at the 250, um, I mean, $230, you, you, you're looking at uh, um, as far as if you, you choose the, 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 the mean and uh, find out what is the evaluation, it will be about 39.10. Now, if you just use the 20, then, and that's again, depending on no recession in a way, we will make that 230. Some people think it will be at 195. So the idea is the forward earnings that looking at the 230s. And, and uh, so that's the valuation. If you use the regular PE, and this is just regular PE, you can see the mean is at 16. And we are at almost 21. So the highest has been was 123. The lowest was at almost six. So if you use the 16 rather than 2016 going uh, forward, then uh, if you want to use the average valuation, then we are looking at um, 3680. Now, one thing you have to remember is also if there is a recession is uh, obviously the slowdown in earnings. So we have to revise 
are earning growth. So um, that's why, again, you have to be selective, not just go and just purely um, buy the markets at this time. I would find some values. So this is another one I want to share with you, which is very interesting. And it, it explains what happened <clears throat> in the past year. And when you think of the Googles of the world, the Amazons and Teslas, and, and uh, when you think about Meta and Microsoft, there is an index, is the S&P 500 equal weighted index. So it takes all the 500 and equally uh, weights them. So what I want to look at it, obviously you can see we bought them in, in October, like any October, <clears throat> mid-October, and we've had a nice run up, uh, but this is the relative strength. I want to show you where we were um, initially from the beginning of the year and where we are now. So we've had a nice strength compared to regular S&P. And the reason is for all these years, and I wanna share that uh, for the past almost 20 years, uh, you can see that for all these years, those me large mega, I mean, the mega cap stocks, there are only five or 10 stocks where, where all the performance was coming from. And finally, things have changed. Now, again, the, being selective, you see that uh, starting from the 2021, and then it's almost like the value is becoming more attractive. And again, beginning of the 2022, you see we've had a nice um, relative strength compared to S&P. So if you want to be diversified, perhaps you should look at equal weight index rather than just SPY by itself, because again, the weights of those mega caps. The last but not least, I want to look at uh, the monthly. You can see we had the support in October and uh, we uh, bounced back from the 50 month moving average nicely. Um, although we did uh, touch uh, the 100, uh, or, I mean 65 monthly moving average, but that's where we are. So basically that will be our support around that zone um all right that so the next i want to talk about the dollar the currencies especially the dollar euro and british pound and yen and let me start with this this is the issue of uh, october 10th i believe of of barons and the cover says the powerful greenback that u.s dollar is near a 20-year high um, who it helps or it hurts and eight ways to invest move. Anyway, remember every time we have a cover magazine, just be aware. So this is where the news came from. And this is the consequence after the whole article written about the dollar. So the dollar we topped in end of September and then the second leg was up in October. And we had... Uh, looked at it as far as we were thinking about international investing, emerging, and what is happening. And if they coincided with what's happening in Europe and a lot of other central banks have started increasing their rates. So US was the place to be because of it was paying the highest deal because the central bank had already started moving the short-term rates, the Fed rates. We also had, obviously we had uh, the crisis on the, you know, in Europe, and that was the place to be. But also, it was making it more difficult for a lot of that burdened uh, economies around the globe too, which is dollar denominated. So, where are we now as far as the the dollar goes? You can see on a long term basis, we are in a very crucial point. So, with at the support. So basically, if we do not bounce or at least flattened, we have a set signal and that that could be 97 could be the next um, next uh, move. Now, speaking of that, the euro has done the opposite. We were meant to 97, we were in the parity. Now the euro is um, 
has decided, you know, when we talk about central banks, you know, uh, President Lajbar, she's uh, hawkish and she said they are going to continue increasing rates. So that's a competition to the dollar. And obviously, the, there's been the fear of recession with the high prices of energy, but we had a warm month, warm winter so far in in in, uh, in Europe. So that has been easing the fear. So we can see that they're moving complete opposite. I think they will be contained, but there's still some room left. The same thing happened in the British pound. When you look at it, obviously there was a mismanagement. There was a lot of talk what happened in this is on a monthly because we did go to like to almost parity to 102 or so uh, because of the tax cuts and then Prime Minister Truce uh, resigned. And so now we've had the bounce. Uh, it looks like UK has weathered the markets better than Europe. Uh, they, the inflation, both in Europe and UK, they peaked also. They that have been coming down, but they also have been hawkish that they're going to keep the interest rates up. So there's a competition to dollar. The biggest one is Bank of Japan, which surprised the markets, and they decided, rather than devaluing yen, finally they're strengthening, and we really peaked almost around 150, and that's been a huge move in Japanese yen. So that looks good. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, the interest rate parity that we use, the dollar is having competition. I don't think it's end of the dollar right now. There's still um, there's still reasons to have uh, the dollar. There's, uh, again, some of them being the geopolitical, but I think the big moves are done with the dollar. So but we also want to watch that um, the support. So what does that mean? What happens is we move to emerging markets and China. So what we look at, uh, first of all, I want to look at globally again. Um, by the way, next week, when we do our investment themes, you're going to look at some opportunities in emerging markets individually. So I'm going to look at generally. So we will review this again, but we wanted to look at the interest rates around the world. I want to have. I want to have this, and also um, basically, what is the inflation around the world and the GDP? Um, but also, you can see the, the the exchange rate versus a year ago. So you can see how the majority of countries they have depreciated against the dollar, and uh, only few really in, in positive. So. Um, and one of them you can see, like, for instance, uh, Brazil, because we will discuss it next week. A lot of these emerging markets, their central banks, they were way ahead and they started increasing the interest rates way before the Fed did. So they are um, ahead of the game. As far as outlook, we will discuss it next week again. But I want to show you uh, this is the Central Asia, the Europe, North America and uh, our, our developed countries and then uh, developing countries in Africa. So basically what we are looking at, this is from the World Bank, is um, looking at the IMF actually, and th they are really concerned about um, the global slowdown. So basically 2020, 21, the world output was at 6%, 22 uh, came at 3.2, and the outlook is 22.7%. So um, you can see that emerging markets are at 3.7%. So what are we looking at talking about emerging markets is with the um, opportunities, and I mentioned to you, not just I've talked about this for last couple of years, I think for the next decade, is going back to the mean. And basically what we want to look at is as far as the weakness in dollar obviously will help emerging markets. Now, also the China play is very important, especially with the trading partners, especially in Asia. So you don't even have to even talk about China. You don't even have to play China per se. You can talk uh, talk about the Chinese partners. And that's what we'll talk next week, such as Thailand and Indonesia and Vietnam, Malaysia. Those are the partners that it, if China opens up and does well, it will help them. So 
uh, one of the most important talking about geopolitics I mentioned to you about again this Russia Ukraine doesn't look it's going to be resolved so these are some of the most important elections to watch for next year uh, in Nigeria presidential one Estonia Estonia again because of Ukraine's situation Finland the same similar thing so if you want to watch elections there Thailand has had been the monarchy for the, the oldest ones so there's been some unrest the military group that we want to watch that Turkey uh, things probably the D key we want to watch with Erdogan what he's going to do in June um, again he's become like a bridge between you know quite a few economies in Europe so we want to watch that Guatemala Singapore Pakistan October 12th Argentina even after winning they had a good feel winning the World Cup but there's a lot of chaos and of course there's still corruption high high inflation so we watch that Poland on the other hand they started their um interest rates cuts I mean in, interest rate raises uh way before and now they are pausing so it, it's important Poland is also again this is a Ukraine and NATO play Spain Democratic Republic of the Congo again we talk about uh, 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 basic material the uranium and uh, Congo Bangladesh which are large large youth population and New Zealand so pay attention to these put them in part of your uh, itinerary to take a look at them so let's look at the international investments with so developed markets I want to look at what has happened in the past uh you know for 14 15 years and you see finally we got a nice relative strength compared to spy SP US markets so we will watch this as far as evaluation again we talk next week now we talked about the PE and the K you know Schiller PE Europe value PEs ratio is like in 12 some of emerging markets are like eight and seven so there are opportunities out there from the valuation even after the markets have dropped so much in the United States so this is as far as developed but also emerging markets you can see we started some movement there about the resistance but again I'm going back on a monthly and then um this is the EEM that was the Vanguard's emerging markets but EEM look how beautifully we got support at the 200 month moving average and we bounced back but of course we are heading to the 50 month moving average again we've had some strength against the SMP um so let's talk about China this is uh this is called U.S. this is a Haller U.S. X China index and what this is they they look at these are the Chinese company based in China which are traded in United States and uh, a couple other countries so they they're more liquid and they look at um you can see this big move and we've talked about China and we talked about it in the end of October so in a big move China is going to play a huge role for this year because of obviously with the zero COVID tolerance and we talked about in China there's less of emphasis on economy and more on the social um, side of things so <clears throat> we don't know what's going to happen um, there is the supply chain had been eased but also if there's another strain of if we talk about COVID or COVID strain then that will interrupt the ports um, so it can go both ways if things work out that will be very important for the whole again global economy and uh, basically that will as I mentioned help the neighbors and the trading partners so that's something that I would say China there is the opportunity presented itself but going forward it's going to be volatile because we still don't have exact um again results we not don't have the clarity so I would be uh, pretty uh selective but there is that opportunity and but uh, talking about the opportunities uh what would is gonna happen again with, with China and I mentioned about the supply chain is um that, 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 as far as uh the, the growth 
the IMF has brought the growth. This is the, the, the lowest, I think it's about 20 years there, uh, on three and a half percent or so. So there are talks about India overtaking the population over China. There's going to be more growth. So basically, uh, that those are the challenges. But things work out. China has a lot of catching up to do. So that will be a good place to start with. Also, China affects the commodities, and that's also it's important. So um, first of all, I want to look at, we talked about the dollar. Obviously, weaker dollar helps the commodities, uh, especially when we talk about precious metals. <laughs> but this is an index from 1760, and it goes to uh, the end of 2021. So I want to look at these cycles and see that, uh, for instance, uh, again, we go back to, we talked at 1781, there was a 33 year bull cycle. Then we had 11 year down cycle and uh, so on. You can see the, the returns. So from um, 1980, uh, and then we had 18 years uh, down cycle to 1998 and then we had a 13 year it was one of the best uh you know that was a lost decade for stock market but boy commodity did so well including gold we were up 700 percent so what has happened in 2020 we finished a down cycle in commodities of 12 years down 76 percent so the question is are we are starting a new cycle in commodities and you can see the average years and average returns. So pay attention to that. And the first thing we look at, which is part of the inflation, is the CRB index. It's a Commodity Research Bureau. And you see, well, we had this perpendicular. I mean, this is vertical, actually. I mean, vertical uh, parabolic move, in a sense. And now we're still above our moving averages in 200 days. Um, 200 month moving average so we still is strong uh, but we have a little correction so um this is our support so we want to watch this so it is weaker dollar obviously that bodes well for the commodities but then the problem you have to think about talking about china and talking about commodities with a stronger global economy in that sense and with china that means more pressure on inflation and that's what we are not 100% sure we are out of the woods yet, regardless of what the interest rates are still trying to do. So, and look at the gold. Gold on the, hit the 15-month moving average. Now we're hitting the resistance. So, but again, it coincides exactly where the dollar decided to top. And then gold basically has moved. And uh, speaking of that, silver is... Um, Obviously, one of my favorites with opening China, if there the, is a global economy expansion, silver will do well. So we, we see that uh, uh, the movement, we are way, way off where we were in 2011, while you see gold is in its, uh, uh, it's in resistance. Um, now, crude oil, it's been a very interesting play, as you call it. I mean, we've had two extremes. We've had we never been the slow. We get for minutes. We went to negative, and then uh, we did hit actually 120 or so because of the Russian Ukraine. Again, this is on a monthly, so you don't see, and it's on line on close. That's the reason you don't see the high. So just bear with me. I know we went over 120, but this is end of the month. So we've been correcting. So let's talk about oil. The question we have to ask is, again, we've had a warmer weather and back east as well as Europe. And uh, the question will be, is, are we done? Are we, uh, is the market going to go down? Although, again, this Ukraine situation has not been resolved. This is my, from the fundamental point of view, I believe we will have a floor of $70. And I think a lot of um, uh OPEC nations will be okay with that. Uh, anything below that it might be challenged. And I think 100, well, I would say 90, but the 100 will be the ceiling. Now, the question is, just because the things are, you know, fed the warm weather and uh, 
things are looking better. That doesn't mean that, again, we are going to go to 50 or $60. We still got geopolitical problems. We have Iran in, in the Middle East, and we have problems in Latin America. And uh, uh, we'll go even further, and you will see, uh, and I'm going to talk about natural gas, so both of them come together. You can see we had this warm weather. What has happened to, I mean, look, um, Natural gas is a very difficult market to trade. I, as a futures trader, I would not encourage you to do that. Crude oil is much more um, reliable source for futures. Natural gas, things like this happen. I mean, somebody's mortgage or the house was taken, <laughs> the mortgage was taken out because you can lose everything. Um, you can use ETFs such as UNG, but be careful if you're going to play natural gas but you can see how fast things can move so why we think that oil why am i using 70 to 72 dollars because of you know president biden came with strategic reserves and um, uh, once they, they first was at 95 and now they're buying it back at 72 so that's been a good deal so they are buying it back so that's from fundamental side and uh, you could see that from the technical side, there was support. But also, I want to look at the stocks of the crude oil. And it, what we see is, in a, when you look at the 10-year range, this is where we have been. And when we look at the 10-year average, this is where we have been. But as far as 2021, this is where we were. And 2022... This is where we are. So the, the concern I've had, and we talk about, we will talk about energy sector next week, is really as far as the production, there's a lot of, with this, uh, again, environmental issues, a lot of companies got hit with the economy and other things. There has not, there has not been any type of improvement. So what is happening a lot of companies have decided, well, you know what, we're going to leave it alone. So just because, you know, again, the, 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 the demand has uh, slowed down, that doesn't mean that the production or the supply is going to go up. And basically, uh, if we have opening up China, that's going to put a positive pressure on crude oil, although they've been we're getting really cheap oil from Russia and Iran. So, but basically that's uh, something that the, the food for thought. So that's why we are not, I'm not too negative on crude oil. I think we are in a, in a, in a range as far as uh, crude oil price goes. This is another one as far as the global energy consumption. I know there is this alternative energy and clean energy, but you know, coal was the biggest mover last year. And you see, there's not much downturn in coal. And uh, you see the petroleum is with us. Granted, renewable are going to grow, and we can see the 2050 and beyond. But right now, there's still a game plan with petroleum and natural gas. So even natural gas is going to continue expansion. So. Um, the last but not least, I will say about copper. Now, copper, again, it's a 51% of copper is used in, in China. So you can see where we were right around the COVID problems that we had. Uh, then we double topped and uh, came right to our support on a monthly basis, at a 50-month basis. We've had a really nice rebound. Again, you can look at the China's um, um, uh, chart and compare it to copper. You see a, a very big correlation. So one of the things about copper and what it tells us, again, it's a China story. If it's over $4, generally that's global expansion. Although IMF is you not know, talking about slow economy and even recession although they believe us is resilient because of employment uh if it even if you had a recession according to imf president it will be a, a soft one but right now copper is saying listen we are healthy 
anytime it goes below three dollars with the copper then that that's recession so watch copper as as a good barometer for the global um uh global health or economy health so all right. I really appreciate uh, your time. I hope uh, it was helpful. It was useful. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the recording and then open up for Q&A. Thank you so much.